I am Dr. Mahendra Bhandari, CEO of the Vatikuti Foundation, a charitable organization involved with the development and dissemination of robotic surgery. Currently, I am at Narayan Ridale or Narayan Health System in Bengaluru. Vatikuti Foundation is a non-profit organization involved with the development and dissemination of robotic surgery and technologies likewise. This is an interview of Dr. Devi Prashad Sethi, the founding chairman of Narayan Health System. The ages of her program, Humans at the Cutting Edge of Surgery. What it simply means is technology without the man behind the machine has no role. a cardiac surgeon, I am a urologist. What is common in us? <laughs> Both of us believe in cutting and stitching to make this world a better place to live. Yes. Uh, to my audience, I am speaking to, I have my ego of on growing in profession as a surgeon for 50 years and I don't easily give recognition to people. I'm talking to somebody I really admired for years. We don't meet often, we have different areas of work. And what intrigues me is that you have an ecosystem within yourself. Thank you. Beginning as a cardiac surgeon, a technician par excellence, uh, conquered the area of patient care by humanistic approach to the management your surgeons become technicians yes entrepreneur par excellence and lot being discussed in the business circle and there are a few questions i like to bring which sure. i heard and thought of during my business school let's begin that uh, you play different roles you play different roles, consoling a family, to establishing a hospital, <laughs> to advising Supreme Court, or evolving a philosophy of what medical education in this country should be, how you should have strategy for COVID. What is that man within you? Which is that puppet master? Because that is what I'm more interested in because as I told you, so many people have written and I don't want to rehash the same. <laughs> I really want to know the man, Dr. <laughs> Devi Sethi. Dr. Bandari, the basic foundation of everything what I want to do is I love people. I, anybody who, even if he's a stranger, I can sit across and talk to them. I travel uh, a co-passenger in the plane or a train, totally stranger. I can talk to them for hours together as if I know them for years. I love people. I want people to be happy. I just can't see anybody in pain or, you know, somebody sad. I want to do something. That is the foundation. Everything else is a minor detail. It's all revolving around. I'm a very happy person. I really, today God comes and stands in front of me and says, I want to give you something materially. Is there anything you want? I have nothing to ask. Whatever I want, he has given me. I don't have a long list of things what I want. I just want people around me to be as happy as I am. So the whole effort is to spread the happiness around me. That's all. You have intrigued another fire, you talk of happiness, and if I could analyze it further and take your sense on, happiness is such a variable interpretation for individuals and individuals at different times. So what I understood, correct me if I'm wrong, happiness during your interaction with me. You want that to be an experience they should cherish. Yes, yes. See, the, you see a lot of pain around. Like, we are doctors. Every day I see 
50, 100 patients coming to this office, the kind of a problem they go to because some child has a problem or the breadwinner of the family has a problem or the young lady, mother of three has a problem, it is a phenomenal problem. Every step they need to take to reach out to the right people, it is a Herculean task. Poorer they are, harder it is for them. When people beg and cry in front of me, like when I see a patient and if I tell the patient that, look, you need a heart operation, they have only one question. That is, how much it is going to cost? And if I tell them it is going to cost, your child's operation costs 3 lakh rupees, that is a price tag on the child's life because they don't have 3 lakh rupees. You look at it, we call ourselves as a civil society. Civil society has given privilege to people like me to put a price tag on human life. This is what every doctor does in developing countries from morning till evening. This is unacceptable. Now, is there a solution? There is a solution. All of us privileged people think that it is a government's duty to take care of the people who don't have the money. But government has given us everything for people like us. Can the government create? They can't. Only we can create. But we haven't done it. And we all take shelter saying that government has to do it. This conversation gives me a deep dive into your personality. Uh, can you tell me how focusing as a sensitive cardiac surgeon in court and quote four walls of operating theater your your focus is yeah. how can you make a healthy heart during bypass eras with anxiety the whole whole operating room people are watching whether the heart will come or fit exactly right. yeah. from there to step out most of our colleagues are not pointing at this is what we are focused at we are specialists, we are in a tubular vision. I will do my best, but what patient does for other things? And this gives me information that a patient is oppressed mentally, physically, psychologically, socially, economically. Now, how can you give a message Hey, fellows, this is only a technician job. All of us are trained with the best people. We have the same intellect. What makes a doctor different from a technician <laughs> surgeon? It's very uh, interesting, Dr. Bandari. I have been operating for so many years now. I look at myself as an instrument in the hand of God. Like I use scissors, needle, holders, and everything. In the hand of God, I am that instrument, nothing more. I got this humility with the experience of looking at people who had no chance to survive after the operation. Their heart is completely damaged. There's no way they can survive. They walk out of the hospital in five days and enjoy the rest of their life like a normal person. At the same time, a patient who has no business to die, good condition, heart, no problem, no as a young person, sometimes they die. Now, if I have to take the credit for the patient who walks out, I should take the blame for someone who didn't make it. That gave me the humility to Accept that we are just a tool in the hands of God. And the belief that there is someone above us monitoring what we are doing, controlling what we are doing, gives you all the confidence and the strength to take the right decision, to do the best for the patient. Yeah. So Narayan Health System, if I go back as I see it today, it's a planned trajectory or it is uh, 
cascading the events <laughs> of your thoughts. If you really, uh, my wife describes me uh, as one of those uh, characters in one of those English movies. He does all kinds of stupid things and in the end, <laughs> everything turns out to be okay. <laughs> so we, it's, it's never planned. It just happened. The society needs, people need it. Exactly. Uh, I, I strongly believe that a lot of things what happens in the society, it's really not planned by anybody. They may, somebody may take the credit. I think everything works in this world by the sheer power of purpose. We strongly underestimate the power of purpose. If your purpose, like our Upanishads, Patanjali, uh, uh, the, the, the Upanishads say, if your intention is to help the mankind, society in a large scale, cosmic forces virtually connive for you to succeed. I have seen time and again, whatever I could do in my life, it has nothing to do with how smart I am or how hard work I, uh, you know, I, I give or, or, you know, how talented I am. It has nothing to do with that. I'll just give you one example. Look at Mahatma Gandhi. I don't think he's five foot nothing. He's not the strongest man. He's not a great orator. He doesn't come from a royal family. He didn't come from a royal family. He could convince 400 million Indians to fight for the freedom, even die for the freedom, when they didn't know what the hell freedom was because they were slaves, their parents were slaves, their grandparents were slaves. How could you tell somebody who has never experienced that you're going to, you've lost this and you know, you should be willing to die for this. It's impossible. And he convinced them at a time, forget about internet, there was not even a newspaper. How could you do it? It is the power of purpose. So if the purpose is honorable, everything else falls into its place. Can you narrate your own example? Maybe not be now, take time to think about where you thought that the whole universe is supporting your, your purpose. And when you had given up as an individual entity. See the, <laughs> I can give hundreds of reasons. Some of the stupidest things, uh, decisions I took really turned out to be the best decision five years, ten years later. You know, that's besides the point. I'll tell you, I was working in Calcutta. And I thought that I would like to live there. I somehow felt that I belonged to that place and I should live there and retire or die or whatever in Calcutta. So I wanted to build a hospital there. So first thing I did was to ask my family to support. They told me that, okay, they will give me the money to build a hospital in Bangalore, but not in Calcutta. Naturally, they're business people and uh, they thought they can control the investment in Bangalore and but I wanted to build in Calcutta. At that time, uh, Mr. Kamath was heading the ICICI. So I talked to him and he said, look, your business plan doesn't justify any uh, investment. But your cause is honorable. So I'll help you. Then I approached Mr. Krishna Kumar, who was the head of... Uh, Tata T at that time in Calcutta. He was involved with the Tata Finance. So I talked to him. His business people looked at the balance sheet and yeah, whatever yeah, I yeah. could create. They again said, look, your balance sheet doesn't justify. But we will see. The purpose is good. We'll see. And each of them invested 5 crore rupees each, gave a loan. And that is how I could start. So, I think amazing things happen mm -hmm. when the purpose is honorable. And then you don't make up things. You stick to your purity at heart. Yeah. 
you don't make up things. You yes. know? If you are designing, yeah, if you want yeah. to achieve some, yeah. you can win a conversation, yeah. not the kind of results what you are talking about. We need to walk the talk. Yeah, that's very important. That's, that's, yes, that's very important. Yes. There are two issues which really intrigued me while I was reading economics and I was, we, we are given enough emphasis on cost and quality curve. Yes. Both don't exist together yes. and there is a trade-off. Yes. And in your your thing, you have improved the curve as much as anybody else can't think of, you know? Yeah. And uh, quality is uncompromising. On the contrary, it is on a higher trajectory. Yes, yes. Cost is the only variable you can adjust. And you brought in, I throw another question so you can combine your answer. You brought in economies of scale. Yes. So can you tell me, I know the driver that you wanted that man not to have the best heart yes. operation, to have the best chance to survive. Yes. But at the same time, taking a step ahead into his personal issues of how he's going to fund this yes. operation. So can you tell me, because your insurance and other things are solutions of second degree to achieve an objective, if yes. I'm not right, I don't know. Yes. yes. You see, the poor people in isolation are very weak, but together they are very strong. Like, our main success is because of the volume we are living in a country with 1.4 billion people. About 14% of the heart surgery done in India is done by us. So when you have the huge volume, you have a differential rising for everything. And also technology has made a massive difference. I strongly believe that India will become the first country in the world to dissociate healthcare from affluence. India will prove to the world that the wealth of the nation or wealth of the family has nothing to do with the quality of healthcare its citizens can enjoy. Now, you may think, oh, it will take 20 years, 30 years. No, it will happen within five years, seven years. And why, uh, why do you have such uh, yeah, strong conviction? Yes, I, I'll tell you why. You look, at, you look at India, what we have done with mobile communication. People living in uh, richer countries, people living in the first world countries, significant number of them don't have the internet connection in their mobile phone because it is too expensive. Here, everyone has internet connection. We have democratized uh, mobile communication. People living in first world countries, good number of them, don't have uh, 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 the you know, privilege of watching all the uh, TV programs. It's too expensive. Only few they can watch. You look at India. You don't need even, a, they people don't even use a TV to watch their favorite program. They watch it in their phone. So we have democratized the richest man in the country and the poorest man in the country watches the same program, laughs at the same joke. We have democratized because of technology and the number of people what we have. That is our strength. And the same thing will happen with healthcare. Everyone in the country will have a health insurance, rich and poor. Cash counter in the hospital will disappear. Nobody is going to pay money for the health care. They all pay once a year. They are primary care, secondary care, tertiary care. Everything will be addressed. Today, we have a very lopsided system. In healthcare delivery, there are three stakeholders, Dr. Bandari. There is a patient, there is a hospital, and there is an insurance company. Hospitals do not trust the insurance company. Insurance company doesn't trust the hospitals. And the patient doesn't trust both parties. So you have a business in which there are three important stakeholders. They don't trust each other. And how do you expect this business to scale up? Once the hospital becomes the insurance company, then, like today when I tell a patient you need a bypass grafting, 
first thing goes to their mind is, is it really required? Whereas when I have given the insurance, when I tell them you need a bypass, there is no conflict of interest because I am paying for the operation. The whole relationship changes. Today, more people develop heart attack, it is good for my business. Once I become the health insurance company, I will do everything possible to make sure they don't develop the heart attack because I lose money if they have a heart attack. Then my interest and the client's interest, patient interest is aligned. And that is what is required in the business. And this is what we want to achieve. There is a large difference between usefulness and wastage. The example what he gave is a wastage and callousness. And what we are trying to do is any surgeon, for him, they have to spend just a couple of minutes to look at the structure. They will know what size fits in. Exactly. Yeah. So it is a culture when you are not under pressure to control cost. You don't need to worry about it. Yeah. You have the luxury to throw things. We don't have the luxury to throw things. Yes. But at the same time, it comes to the patient because there's no one answer for everything. If exactly. you need something to be done at that yes. point in time, you will do it. Exactly. Because it's not a uniform pattern of cost distribution. It is a situation specific. See, Dr. Bandari, the, uh, when a patient following heart operation lands in trouble, earlier we are using balloon pump. Now there is something called ECMO. Okay. ECMO is very, very expensive. We have been putting patients on ECMO for the last 20 years. We have perhaps one of the largest experience in the world in putting patients on ECMO. Any problem with the heart, we rest them and we put them on ECMO and after one week, two weeks, three weeks, one month, we take them off and they go home. Till date, we have never charged a single patient, rich or poor, for the ECMO. This is what we believe, that the patient gave the money for the outcome. Whatever happens in between, that is not his problem, it is our problem. But have we become poorer by doing it? No. <laughs> I, I know that you have trained so many people, you know, not only cardiac surgeon, your faculty who works comes under your influence. How many Devi Shetties you can put fingers on? I am very uh, uh, happy with the uh, younger generation. Very no, I'm truly talking about which you would believe as you believe in yourself. As a uh, cardiac surgeon, I'll narrow the question. Yeah, the, the, uh, I am lucky because some of the surgeons I train today, they are famous and they are occupying very important positions across the world. So I'm very happy about it. I'm very bullish on the younger generation because they are extremely skilled, very passionate, very hardworking. I know we are always skeptical about the younger generation, but a good number of the children, we are involved in training and uh, t guiding them. I am, they will take this country to a different level. I have no doubt about it. Main reason, uh, Dr. Bandari, they are all standing on the shoulders of the giants. Their view of the horizon is much better than our view. They look at it differently. They will change the way things happen in this country and across the world. I am very confident. I think the conversation has reached a very interesting, and I'll narrow it down, that uh, we give everything. We don't have a special cupboard. Whatever we have, we give it to them. Yes. There's nothing, uh, pan, parag, <laughs> you know, something which nobody knows what the secret yes. sauce. Yeah. We give everything. And quite a bit depends upon their receptivity. Yes. Everybody doesn't translate it. Some way translate it for their material gains or whatever is the driver behind yes. it. My question is that you are good at managing one of the most complex situation, pulmonary hypertension. Yeah, thanks. thanks. And I had a patient 
And I went, I won't name, you know, one of the top cardiac surgeons and told him that uh, I don't want you to tell me with your theoretical knowledge, if I'm the patient, who would you send it to? <laughs> and he was a good friend. Mm. So he said, neither I'll do it, mm. nor I'll let anybody do it. Mm. He, uh, it's all about the passion, focus, compassion. There are multiple things. And the perseverance. One reason why even the talented surgeons pursue to the level of perfection in whatever they want to do is the uh, perseverance. And the Identity. individual non-scholastic uh, capability? The generally, some people will never give up. See, I will never give up if I decide to do something. Not only in surgery, if I decide, I was uh, watching my kids typing. For me to type, I use two, three fingers and uh, just look at the keyboard and type. I was watching my kids the way in speed in, by which they type. Around a month ago, I looked at it. I said, okay, I should type like that. Then I told my kids that I want to type it. You know, can you just tell me how it works? They said, oh, daddy is too late for you. <laughs> <laughs> so I went to uh, uh, YouTube and I saw how to learn typing. Now, I think it's about a month. I can type as fast as any of the youngsters. Essentially, there is nothing in this world we can't learn. Right, exactly. Uh, you know, as long as you are very, very persistent. Yeah, but this, is, this is a very interesting thing. <laughs> Several years ago, when computer came in 90s, I had the same problem. My <laughs> steno would quickly do yes. that and without looking at it, and I would do like this. And then there was a program known as Typing Tutor. Yes, yes. And it's such a great game that within 15 days you learn. So, oh, yes. <laughs> same thing may be happening in surgery. And there are three components. One, you know what is ideal. Yes. Two, you know what you can do. And how to do that becomes simple. Yes. Is that the kind of thing. I would like to know from you, there is no role model of healthcare systems in the world. Yes. On the contrary, they are examples of we should not do that. Yes. yes. <laughs> yes. I believe not only for India, across the world, the only model which will sustainable, scalable, and possibly perpetually it will be the model is the affordable health insurance. That's the only model. The reason is, let's look at, we are all aware, since independence, we have been hearing about universal health care for free to every citizen of India. We have done extensive studies on countries which have managed to offer universal health care for free with the taxpayers' money. There are three things common with them, Dr. Bandari. First thing, they are all small countries, 10 million, 20 million, 40 million people. No large country in the world, including United States of America, can offer health care free to the citizens with the taxpayers' money. It's not possible. Second thing, these countries have a very high tax to GDP ratio of more than 25, 45%. Third thing, all these countries are spending more than 10% of the GDP on health care already. We are spending about one and a half, 1.2%. percent they have gone up a little. So the, there is no question of India thinking about offering free health care to the citizens. But what India is doing now is the clever thing they are doing. The insurance regulatory body has been revamped with wonderful people, brilliant people. And they want to have health insurance for every citizen of the country. Not only health insurance, they want insurance to be available to the common man for every aspect of life. And that is going to be a game changer. That is going to be a game changer. Because people pay money for the mobile phone. Today in India, most people even the so-called poor people spend at least 300, 600 rupees per month 
just to speak on the mobile phone. So you pay the similar amount of money, you can have a health insurance. So we have close to, uh, you know, 900,000 uh, million people who, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the pay uh, 300, 500 rupees for mobile phone. So if everyone pays, it, I can tell, give one example. 100 million families in India pay just 10,000 rupees per year for health insurance, which should cover primary care. That's very important. Primary care, secondary and tertiary care. Dr. Bandari, we will collect 1 lakh crore. That is more than the central government's health care budget for the whole country. That is the power of India. We can do amazing things. Yeah. And that is simply because the, the, the kind of uh, social culture we have among us, people, the acceptability, God-fearing nature, they, there are no hardened views of cultural influences on India, no baggage as I see them. Dr. Bandari, we produce how healthcare is delivered. Healthcare, the pillar of healthcare are the skilled workforce. We produce the largest number of doctors in the world. Yes. We have more than 700 medical colleges. No country in the world has that many medical colleges. We graduate more than 1 lakh students every year. We produce more than 3 to 4 lakh nurses every year. Right? And we are the pharmacy for the world. We have everything required for a great health system. The only missing link is people don't have the money. But People do not have the money to pay for the health care, but they have the money to pay for affordable health insurance. So once the affordable health insurance comes, the whole thing is going to change. You talked of technology and I have had previous such informal conversations with you. Both of us believe that technology is the one which amplifies human cognition. Yes. And it should not be taken as competitive, it's complementary to what yes. you do. But of late with the large learning models, the, there, is a, there is a very different thinking in the whole circle. A lot of debate is going on. How do you differentiate between technological assistance and technological dominance? I'll give you an example from our point of view from the healthcare providers. We know that electronic medical records will make healthcare safer for the patients. We know it will make it affordable. We know it will make accessible. But less than 20% of the hospitals in the world have electronic medical record. So because there is no electronic medical record, you can't standardize treatment, you can't monitor, there is no accountability. So for everything, you have to go near the bedside. You want to see the x-ray, you have to go near the bedside. You want to see the blood reports, you have to go there. Now. We, we built a uh, platform uh, called Atma. The patient, doctors, nurses, technicians, and the machines are in the same eco. They're all connected with each other. And we spent millions of dollars. Whatever money we earn, we put it on there. Now it is ready. We built it for our patients. Now, at some point of time, we want to give it to any hospital in the world which want to use it at a price what can afford. If I have one kilo of rice, I give you half a kilo of my rice, I lost my half a kilo of rice. I developed Atma for taking care of my patients. I give you one copy. You can have exactly what I have and I haven't lost what I have. You don't need to pay me. Yeah. That will dramatically change everything, uh, Dr. Bandari. Every hospital in the world will have the most advanced electronic medical record. Doctors in their phone, they can do virtually do everything what they do sitting next to the patient. Yeah. And that can come to them virtually free. See, if you look at uh, uh, as the longevity has increased because of development in healthcare, one major handicap you find is the availability of information yes. archival, yes. comprehension of that in yes. information, yes. and synthesis of that information, information. to take, take. Yes. You take a cancer patient for 20 years. Yes. 
hundred and one pets cats. Yes. But sorry to say, ninety nine percent of decisions are on the last follow up. Exactly. But that is possible with this yes. technology. Yes. Yes. So what you say is there cannot be a disagreement on what that. But the question is, I would like to use this medium and your following and authority to convey to the people what should be their rightful view of the technology. How should they see? Because I find a lot of confusion <coughs> at all the circles, you know. I was listening to a podcast from Oxford. 50 years this guy has been working on ethics, on, on religion, and um, uh, talks of the human trajectory of evolution of four billion years. But there is a confusion, there is a wave of confusion. One group says that you are creating a monster which is going to eat up. The other group says that no, it would not because there is no switch off button. And if you see the AI, machine to machine, there is no problem, we have technologies. But even humanoid robots are scared to have a machine-human interaction. So how do you give to young medical graduates what should be? Because adoption of technology, whether nuclear thing has a sensible or societal good use or a destructive use, depends upon humans. So I feel it's very important in medical profession to tell how exactly they should view this Developments which are hurricane developments and this, uh, you know, we, which are unbelievable. Dr. Bandari, the only hope for democratizing access of essentialities of life, that's the healthcare, food, education, that will only happen with deep penetration of technology. Without technology, there is no way you will have all these becoming available to everyone and technology also will create a world which is filled with surplus. We believe that cost of everything will go down. Yes. It's a matter of time because of the technological. Every tool we develop can save life or the same tool can take away the life. For example, as a surgeon, I use the knife to save people's life. Others, there are few people who use the knife to take away Absolutely. somebody's life. So that doesn't mean we shouldn't make the life uh, knife. Yeah, we yeah. need to. Yeah. Yeah. So essentially, this kind of a discussion has been going on for generations. Every time, yeah. starting from the uh, hand looms getting replaced with the machine looms, thinking that thousands of people lose the job. Yes, a lot of people lost the job, but then more jobs were created. So essentially, we should not come on the way. One thing is, this world, there is something called cosmic force or a god or something which is guiding all of us. You forget about these uh, digital tools and uh, you know, the, the, they, they uh, killing the people. Just look at, stand on the show, uh, you know, seashore, if the sea level go, goes up by few few feet, we all will be dead. Why it doesn't go up? You think it is automatic? No. Something is monitoring. So even destructive things will come from human mind. There is somebody up there to control what the devil's mind works. And I don't think we need to lose our sleep. At the same time, we can't be casual about it. But we should never come on the progress of the thing. Uh, don't blame me for overshooting time because you have thrown <laughs> another question which I think I, I promise this is the last question. Sure. Do you, because you talk of God uh, a lot. And <laughs> you, you, uh, so, the, do you believe that uh, the universal growth is finite, whatever has happened is, exists and what we find is I give example of a, a monkey riding elephant that I did a research for the first time in the world. It's, a, it's an illusion that monkey feels that he's driving. That. <laughs> yeah. So what do you feel? There are two views I would narrow. One is that 
humanity is pushing the boundaries, not so much with the motive of improving the quality of human being. And second is everything is finite. Whatever growth had to take place is existing. We are just researching them. See the, <clears throat> every great thing happened in the world because of the good intention. Somebody had a good intention, so many events happened and in the end life became better than what it was before. You start thinking about civilization, democracy, communism, whatever, all these things. In the end, it is a innate desire of a human being to be happy and to be surrounded by people who are happy. There are more people in this world always who want others to be happy compared to the people who want people to be unhappy. Yes. Right? So we really don't need to worry about, you know, all these destructive elements, you know, hurting and civilization coming to an end. Because when God created human being, he gave the balance that there is a strong balance of people who want good things to happen. Right. Yes. So I am very optimistic yeah. about the future. So elephant is controlling whatever monkey feels. Exactly. Like monkey it. may be thinking it's in control. Yes. Yes. Thank you very much, Doctor. Thank you.